hey, family, wow, is today going to be special for you? Our guest is Francine A. Lafrac. Now, let me tell you, Francine is a force of nature, and you can learn so much about her by visiting her website, which is the uh, FALfoundation.org. She also is present on Same Sky, and you can go visit that website as well. But today, you get to visit directly with her. You know, I wanted to invite Francine to the podcast, although she and I talk often and have our own very deep and personal relationship, because she's too big a power to just keep to myself when I have an opportunity to share someone like her with you. Francine has a very modest presence, but everything she says has a very powerful and enriching purpose. And I learned that about her very early on when I met her, where we served together on the board, the Women's Leadership Board at Harvard University. Um, Francine has had a very, very career. And although Francine could have been considered a child of privilege, she actually has done most of her work to ensure that others are lifted up from poverty, poverty of circumstance, poverty of finance, and poverty of spirit. Francine equates education as being really important on a financial and a confidence level when it comes specifically to women. And I can hardly wait for you to enjoy her conversation here. Um, Last thing I'm going to say before I welcome her to our conversation is that Francine does everything intentionally. She is one of the best thought leaders I've ever met. And much of what she's doing was seeded from her own passion for humanity and her skill of bringing that into fruitful and dynamic essence. And she's done that with data to support it. Wait till you hear some of the stuff Francine Lafrac is doing, has done, and will continue to do. Welcome, my dear friend, Francine Lafrac. Hey, Francine, how you doing, girl? I'm doing great. Better seeing you. Well, I tell you what, there is a saying I grew up with, and I'm sure you're well familiar with it, too. We can do well and do good at the same time. When I think about that, I can't think about anyone in front of you on that level. Not only do you continue to uh, just build up women and build up communities, But Francine, you're teaching in the process. Many people in your position are simply happy to give something and keep moving. You continue teaching and innovating, and there's so much to talk about. Before we get to that, though, I just really want to talk about what made you this person. What's happened in your life? How did you grow up to bring you to where you are today? I have to start by saying the same thing to you because you are such a role model and you teach and you do well and you do good and you're such an incredible example. So I stand in awe of you. You are some fabulous person. So let's go back. Um, I was born with the empathy gene, which was a great gene to have. And even as a little girl, there's a story when I was six years old and I went to my grandparents' um, home and they took me to the hat union meeting and it was a room full of two or 300 people. And the man on stage said, we have no place to meet for our next meeting. So I said, well, got on this, I got on the chair and I said, well, why don't you come to our basement? And I offered my family's basement for the next meeting. So it, you know, I think you're born a certain way, but I also had parents that felt very strongly about giving back to the community that they helped create and really enriching the community with playgrounds and Um, gym facilities and concert halls. And, you know, I think it really enriched me to sort of see the kind of life that I wanted to live and to feel the privilege of being able to live that life. Oh, Francine, you know, um, 
I've hosted so many conversations and wow, this, I think you pretty much take the record on bringing me to tears early on because it's, as you talk about basement meetings to help people to improve their lives. And we've just, we just transitioned from Black History Month to Women's History Month. You, you moved me to think about all the basement meetings that happened in the journey for so many people. Um, I mean, it's the stuff of movies, but more importantly, it's the stuff of the moment. And you've continued to be that person. It's informed you in how you built your life. Um, every time I've ever taught with you, and we've known each other for how long now? My goodness, we serve on the Women's Leadership Board at Harvard together. And we've had great conversations and we've known each other for a while, yes? Say about 15 years, maybe. And every time I talk with you, every time I hear you speak, about things that excite you. It's always about serving others. That empathy gene runs deep for you. Who've been your role models beyond your own family that have, um, have helped you to know how to put that empathy gene to work? Well, I have to say, um, you know, the Women's Leadership Board helped me a lot and I wanna share a story with you because I'm curious if it's the same experience you had in 2004, when I went to my first meeting and I sat in the room and I sat in a room with 150 women struggling with how to make women's lives better, how to uh, caring about women, a light bulb so big went off in my head and I felt, oh my God, I'm home. And I didn't know how I longed for that. I didn't know how much it meant to me until I was in that room. And I realized I have to devote my life's work to this. And I have to find a way to do it, to make it my own. But it just was very important. And I think your viewers will relate to this. I grew up in a very male dominated family. So my father told my sisters and I, I at a very young age, you can't go in the family business. We don't want you in the family business. That's not a, an, op, an option. And I realized there was the boys club and um, the boys controlled things. And um, I had to kind of work around and maneuver around and find a way to find my voice. And when I walked in that room and realized how women support each other, I said, this is so important to me because the missing ingredient for women is confidence. It's the, miss, it's the secret sauce to making better decisions, to feeling more whole as a person, to treating other women better. You know, I just feel so strongly about this. And I said, what can I do? And people like Muhammad Yunus, who wrote the book, Banker to the Poor, realized that talent is everywhere, but opportunity isn't. And he said, if I gave these women in Bangladesh an opportunity to run telephone, cell phone businesses, they would fly. And then they became the bankers. I mean, he gave thousands and thousands of micro loans and these women, 98% of them paid back. And seeing women thrive is one of the great things you can experience. So that really set me on a course. And the Women's Leadership Board set me on a course too, because people like Swanee Hunt, for instance, were going into Africa and places, third world countries and saying to me, why don't you come to Liberia? Why don't you come to Rwanda? And I'm thinking to myself, really? I'm not sure I could do that. My husband's telling me there are airborne diseases. I don't know if I have the courage to do it. And it was like leading by example, seeing her doing that, making a difference in these women's lives that really inspired and gave me a lot of confidence. So yeah, some of the people. 
I, I, I remember being at her home uh, uh, once and we were talking about getting women elected. Do you remember that? Uh, getting women elected around the world, not just here in the U.S. And the conversations, the passion, the intelligence in that room, it was just so supporting. And when you left, you not only left better informed, you left uh, better purpose, didn't you? Absolutely. But seeing women in Afghanistan, in South Sudan, in these countries where they really didn't have a chance being in parliament for the first time was so inspirational. And then of course, Rwanda, where 64% of the parliament is made up of women. Oh my, oh my, women inform that country. And that country is the Singapore of Africa. Yes, even, yes. Even the way they managed uh, COVID is, mm -hmm. is is so ahead of their neighbors. So, you know, seeing women take their power, own it and stand forward and inform a country is so great to see. And really Swanee opened my eyes to that in, in many ways and introduced me to some of those players. Well, you know, your eyes were pretty open before you met Swanee, but she has been impactful. She was so impactful to so many who we know. Um, and you mentioned COVID. Before we get to all the good you've done in COVID, because, lady, I can hardly wait till we can be together and just hug you for you. I mean, you've done some incredible things that we all just have to know about, not just because they're incredible and, 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 and great feelings, you know, come from it, but because, again, as you always teach, you lead by example. And I think other people can figure out how to do some of the things you're doing. I do want, though, Francine, to go back a little bit because, you know, when your dad made it clear to you and your beautiful sister, who I'm so excited has joined our Women's Leadership Board, when he made it clear that you were not going to run that business, yet you are some of the most educated, intelligent women in America today, how did you, how did you intake that? Here you are. Uh, you're, you're fully vested to do anything in the world, but gender set you apart from it if you stayed that course. How did you intake, and, and, and daddy's girl, how did you intake that? What did it, what did it tell you about you? I think it, it was, um, I think it was extremely difficult and I think it was extremely painful. And I think that it told me that um, I would not receive that kind of recognition and that there was the boys' toys and the girls' toys. And, um, you know, it also gave me wings because at, at starting at age 13, I traveled the world. I really found trips to go on, schools to attend, and I, was fortunate that I was born with the travel gene. So travel was my university without walls. So as much as the family situation was limited, seeing the world and meeting people opened my eyes and communicating and it made me feel bigger and bigger. Actually, my mother tells a story when I was young and Every night they had to get on the telephone because they didn't know where I was. Every night they had to get in a car and start looking for me because I had so many friends in the neighborhood and they didn't know whose house I was at because all of these houses were so welcoming and I just kept going, you know? And so um, uh, it certainly motivated me to find another way to express myself. And I could never think of myself as a victim. I always feel that I've been given, um, I have gratitude about the gifts that I've been given. And it was just, I had a terrific need to express them. And so if it meant leaving the house and going around the neighborhood and finding out what was going on there, um, that worked for me until I could fly. That, that, you know, that's so not simply inspiring. Again, that's very teaching because you found other ways to be ready, 
and to share in that process. And that's just you. That's just you. I mean, I started this conversation saying doing well and doing good at the same time. If you look it up, you're going to see your, your face there. Francine, as you, I, I, I just want to ask you one more thing about this early distinction you saw between women's roles and men's role. It obviously played a huge role in how you decided to live your life and to gift your life forward. Did you ever have a conversation with your dad about that? Did you ever go back and talk with him about how that mattered to you? I mean, it's obvious that you stepped forward and said, I'm going to do my thing. Uh, but how did you, how did that conversation go with dad? And where was your mom in that really, conversation? You know, I think that that my mother's an interesting person. Um, she graduated from Barnard as an economics major and became a housewife. Mm -hmm. And she married a hurricane. My father was a hurricane. And so she had a lot of strength just surviving. But she never used all the assets that God gave her, except believing in her children and being a great mother wow. and she at the end of the day didn't have the confidence to sort of stand up to the hurricane but who could i mean mm -hmm. who could when it's that extreme but um she knew and she always told me that i was special and he knew i was his muse in a certain way but he knew, maybe he knew, I don't know, we never discussed it. Um, he was very clear about his boundaries. So at the end of the day, it's my nephews and nieces saying, you know, your father missed the opportunity of his life. And they remind me of that. But I've ne I never really had that conversation with him because he also loved me, you know, so I didn't, you know, it's just that I found ways to make him proud. Producing Broadway shows, nobody was more proud of me for winning a Tony Award or producing shows. In fact, it got so bad that he was taking credit for all of it and had to like shut him down, you know. And then I drove him absolutely crazy when I moved to Hollywood. Oh my God, he was so upset about that because Hollywood, the Wild West, I can't help you there. And of course I was there during an earthquake and all of this crazy stuff, but um, he was so proud of winning, you know, Emmy awards and all the accolades that I received. And I had that place in his heart that was that sense of pride. So... It just the discernment. And, and in many ways, he was a product of how he had grown up as well. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, he didn't. He didn't independently make a decision that he would gender specific his kids in terms of their opportunities. He um, he he likely had a lot of commitment and conviction to how he became the man he was as well. That was framed by some pretty dynamic circumstances and beliefs. But I, I have to tell you, you talked about uh, moving to Hollywood and you, you do have wanderlust even now. So I know COVID is tough for you, uh, but what was it like? Because you know, you're know you bringing this East Coast sensibility to the West Coast and you call your dad you know, a hurricane. You got a bit of that energy yourself, lady. Well, I appreciate that. But, you know, I was always an idea queen, but implementing ideas is what it's all about. And I took my hard knocks like everyone else did in Hollywood to find my voice and to find my way. But, you know, working in the theater really gave me a background to deal with Hollywood. But Hollywood is the Wild West. It's still the Wild West. <laughs> it, it morphs and transforms itself every 10 years. And, you know, you have to be able to transform with the disruption. It's not easy. It's not easy. And, 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 and I'll tell you something, transforming 
with the disruption, you could hashtag that. You could teach classes on that. I mean, you specifically, um, you've done a bit of that now that you're, um, you're homed in New York. And I recall a conversation you and I had, we even threatened to talk with each other in PJs over it. Um, but you were doing some things in New York early on in COVID. You've been lauded for it uh, publicly, but I really think the opportunity for you to talk about why you did it and importantly, how you were able to do it that can be teaching to others. Um, I think this is the moment for that. Would you really share with us so that we can learn? We were all sheltered in place in New York, which as you know, uh, Elmhurst, Queens was the epicenter of the virus, the amount of deaths in New York, and it just was awful. And we watched television and we saw every day what was going on. And what struck me were the food lines around the country. And I really felt, oh my God, look at me. I can call up Citarella or any of these food delivery services and get anything I want. What is it like for other people who can't get food and have never been in this situation before? And I said, I, I have to do something about it. So I started to research different food distributors and I found the Food Bank for New York. And I said to them, look, the epicenter of the virus is Queens. There are about six communities that are most affected. What do you have for those communities? And they said, well, we're suffering now because the need is 400 times and more than a third of the food pantries have closed. They were operated by elderly people who can't leave their house. Mm -hmm. And how about the elderly that are home that are not getting meals delivered to them? They said, we have a real problem here. And I said, well, I'd like to find a solution. And, uh, you know, I'd like to work on those six communities in Queens specifically and come up with ideas to how to fix the problem. So we came up with food trucks to deliver meals. And I saw some remarkable things. First of all, the people on the line at the, you know, at the food trucks, these people had never been on a food line before. These people didn't deserve this. It was not their fault. And it really um, touched my heart that they had to, you know, go on these food lines because they had no choice. And their children were eating much less food at dinner because they had to make the food last. And so it was so much for me to bear to see how these people had suffered. But at the same time, I saw something so beautiful, which was they would go in their apartment buildings and knock on neighbors' doors to make sure they were all right and they had enough food. Mm -hmm. And I saw something you don't imagine in New York, which is this neighborly, behavior of people supporting each other. And I saw that and I was, you know, so touched by that. But then I saw something else, which is the undocumented people. They were sleeping outside the churches that were providing food because they were afraid if they were in the back of the line, they wouldn't get food. So they were sleeping outside. And I just thought this was such an important point. And we ended up raising money, but donating over 2 million meals. Mm -hmm. And not only did we donate the 2 million meals, we started um, for 14 food pantries, a refrigeration system, so they could handle the impact, they could handle the overflow and they would be able to use technology to their advantage. And I didn't think it was gonna be a problem um, Thanksgiving. You know, I kept, when I went into COVID, you know, it was March. Oh, it'll be over by May. Oh, I'll go to Europe in, in July. Oh, it can't be September. And then the food bank said to me, we have a real problem for Thanksgiving, can you help us? And I couldn't believe it. 
And they, it was completely true. They had a huge problem and we did a push to help them with that problem because you can't imagine what it must feel like to not have a, a Thanksgiving dinner and, and not have food on the table for your family. I mean, my focus is job training. It's not food providing. But how can you think about job training and getting a job when you don't have food on the table to feed your family? And this affected so many people. I mean, I recently looked at the numbers for poverty in America and imagine what's happened to it. We did so well with poverty and now we've gone back and you know who's been affected the most, it's women. Women have dropped out of the workforce. They're taking care of their children and dealing with the school. And we've lost so many women. We're back to the 1950s. It's almost like a generation. And it's really scary. And women are the ones that need our support the most, which is why training and education and confidence building is so critical. And you keep confidence building at the same level as the training and the literal education. Francine, you've invested so much of yourself and of your resources into training women to run their own businesses. I think again, because you and I have such wonderful conversations um, and I learned so much from you, it would really be valuable for you to talk a little bit about not just why you do that. You've made that obvious um, in your conversation thus far, but how are you doing and what are you doing in terms of training women to run their own businesses? Well, uh, uh, a perfect example is we've just had our 10th graduation at the Women in Need Homeless Shelter in Harlem. And it's stunning to me that we do the six week course and we've had to pivot to online and remote, which took a little bit of, you know, finessing because the homeless shelters are very old and they mm -hmm. have very mm -hmm. thick walls mm -hmm. and it's very difficult for them to get service. And, and uh, it's been about getting hotspots for everyone and computers and all of that. But what struck me is who is in the homeless shelter? They're medical assistants, there are teachers. And, you know, there's one common theme. I mean, how do you get into a homeless shelter? It's a whole other conversation, but it's been an eye opener for me because I had a pre idea of who would be in the homeless shelter. And you liken the homeless shelter, you liken the women in homeless shelters here to the women in Rwanda, don't you? Yeah. The thing is that I was so wrong. There's so many talented people there. And what's happened to them? They've gotten into a bad relationship. They've had an illness in their family that financially impacted them. But the quality of the people there would knock your socks off the quality of the work and the appreciation to have this course, but not only the course of teaching them compute, you know, to refine their computer skills, but it's the sisterhood, it's the camaraderie, it's the sense that they can have a support system. And that's what, exactly what I saw in Rwanda that was such a, a, a difference when you start working with women and they use their hands and they're, they're in it almost like a knitting circle and they bring all their problems and they bring all their insecurities and they have each other to share, I know. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and people listening to this podcast don't know what we just did, uh, but please share that story too. <laughs> So, God, in 2008, I started um, Same Sky, which was a trade initiative, which was my way to help women in Rwanda who survived the Rwandan genocide. And you'll appreciate this 
the first trip I took to Rwanda, I said to myself, you know, I was a little afraid. And I said to myself, all the people that go to Africa and say it changed their life, that won't happen to me. Well, to be honest with you, as soon as I got off the plane, I swear, started to meet the women. I was completely transformed, transfixed, and totally moved by them because these people had survived the most unspeakable things, yet they had their values, a sense of courage, a sense of reconciliation, um, an eye towards the future to take care of their families, and a sense of hope. And I just basked in that glory of who these women were. And who, how did I know they were so talented with their hands? Anyway, this woman, Janet Nicobana, told me the women most affected by the genocide and in the worst shape were the ones that had been raped who were HIV positive. And basically, they're just waiting to die. They're so poor, they don't have the ability to go and get free medication, which George Bush had supplied in PETFAR. They're so poor, they, they're just waiting to die. And I said, those are the ones I wanna work with. And we started working with four of them and they were so talented with their hands. I realized that the best philanthropy is a job, not a handout. The greatest gift is to, to believe that talent is everywhere, but opportunity isn't. And if you can give these people opportunity, you can give them a life and their family a life. So, uh, you know, we went from four women to 200 women and we started making beautiful jewelry. And I can tell you one story, which is I brought this necklace to the jewelry district on 47th street. And I said, can you make me another sample? And the people looked at me and they said, are you out of your mind? We can't do this kind of work here. This <sighs> is so labor intensive. It would take us, you know, days and days. And yet when I go to Rwanda, they're just so gifted with their hands and their hands are connected to their heart, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and you feel that they put all that love into the jewelry. And I realized that if I took this jewelry and sold it to my friends, we could all be part of the ethical shopping movement where you buy things that make a difference in people's lives. And it makes you a better person because you're connected all under the same sky. So we did that. And then um, about four years later, I got a call to start working in America because Jim McGreevy, the former governor, was working at Hudson County Jail. And he said to me, I can't get the women the formerly incarcerated women jobs. So I said, well, I'll come out to New Jersey and we'll make jewelry. So we went out to New Jersey, we gave them beautiful materials and we all started to make jewelry and we used flexible hours. So they had time to go for their hearings and whatever the childcare, whatever it was, but they could earn money even if it was 10 o'clock at night and per bracelet, we paid them. And the result was great. Some of them got their children back. One is trying to open an art gallery. One went to business school. One started working for Supercuts. Anyway, they all had that entrepreneurial spirit and they all got the strength from each other working around that table, like a knitting circle, kind of like what we have at the Women's Leadership Board where yes. you bring your truth. You know, and I encourage every woman not to be alone. And I encourage every woman to be part of some kind of a circle because that's how we can really speak to the deepest part of ourselves and each other. And that's how we can really love each other. And, 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 and one of the beautiful things amongst so many of how you approached uh, having women uh, uh, earn incomes who otherwise wouldn't have had that opportunity, let's be clear about it, in the circumstances they found themselves, is that you had them work together literally and figuratively. And that had to have given them so much more than just a check. It's true. You know? 
But I believe philanthropy must engage all of you. It's not about writing a check. It's mm -hmm. about engaging your talent and your gift and what God gave you and to, to be a mentor, to be part of it, to whatever your skill is, if you're good at reading, if you're good at language, if you're good at math, whatever that skill is, to share that skill with others who are less fortunate. It's such a great opportunity. So my skill that I shared was a producer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. things that I learned on Broadway and in Hollywood, I was able to share. And of course, I was good at jewelry, but that was kind of naturally. And, 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 and most skills are transferable in the highly qualified. So you go, girl, on that. I think when those women are sitting and they're working together, whether they're working independently and they have those flexible hours, you created a network of them that allowed them to support each other in a way that our experiences might not have offered them being that they share some of the same, not just needs, but journeys and they could be valuable to each other. So I think, I, I just think there's so much to learn from what you did there, how you approached lifting them up. Brooklyn, Brooklyn Workforce Innovations is, is, is really close to your heart. Can you expand a little bit more on it? So what's amazing about Brooklyn Workforce Innovations is it's men and women, and they learn how to do uh, um, different trades, like cutting glass or being carpenters or things that have to do with lasers. And they also use their hands, but mm -hmm. they also get to work on sets. They work mm -hmm. on the movies that are made in New York and, and become production assistants and work in different areas of expertise. So it's all about giving skills and getting back to work. To me, that's the secret sauce. If you wanna solve the problem, lift people up economically, let them lift themselves, let them do it themselves, give them the tools and they will thrive. And Brooklyn Workforce is an example. We have a thousand girls who are studying computer coding at Perscuolas, who we've given scholarships to. And a lot of these girls are mothers and have so many obstacles to their success, but they're diligent and they're hardworking and then they get great jobs. So we're talking about people that earn maybe 11,000 a year going to 35 or 70,000 a year. It's such a big difference. And it's so good for their self-esteem. This, this, this is incredible stuff. And then there's Bernard and the Center for Wellbeing as well. Well, that's a piece of my heart. So Barnard came to me and they said to me, we want to build a center for well-being in physical and mental well-being. And as you know, Barnard is the number one girls' college in America. And as you know, even pre-pandemic, but with the pandemic, mental health and physical health and what's happened to these kids is just unbelievable. I mean, whatever we've experienced, multiply it by a thousand for kids not being able to interact and go to class and what it's like for them and how can they thrive. But I said to them, I have to tell you what would interest me. I said, you have two pillars, physical and mental. Well, let me tell you the most important pillar to connect those two, it's financial. And I said, if you wanna build a center, it's gotta have these three pillars. To me, financial wellness is just as important as physical and mental. And until you have financial wellness, you're not gonna have physical and mental wellness. And we've got to put it together. Every school wants to talk about physical and mental and financial is an add-on. It's never part of the central focus. And this is a girls' school. And let me tell you what really impacts me a lot. I don't care if a woman has, you know, is brought up in complete poverty or very well-to-do. 
we hit a financial wall in our lives. The financial wall is the taboo. Less than 30% of women feel comfortable with money. And you would appreciate this now. Women control 60% of the wealth in, in this country, but 80% of that money is controlled by men. Mm. Women allow themselves, they don't take responsibility, they don't learn that skill, and it really depletes their self-confidence. Well, you know, uh, when you talk, Francine, about women and financial empowerment, it hits really close for me because I'll tell you a story of two women. One is a dear friend to me whose husband was an outstanding and renowned physician and had a practicing physician center that employed other doctors. When he passed away, she learned two things. One, his behavior had not taken care of her and her family. And two, she didn't have a solution beyond her children. This is a lady who lived in one of the highest income per capita neighborhoods in the nation who found herself at the mercy of the charity of her children a brilliant and beautiful woman who had given up her time and resources when married to her husband to many organizations and activities around empowering others. And she was left powerless by the sudden death of her husband. I knew her well, uh, I know her now and her children have shown up well for her, uh, but that's not a success. Uh, and then the second story, is of a young lady who was attending school in Atlanta. And she found herself without funds her second year, her funding source dried up. And the guys around her were following the exact same process she was for attempting to apply for money. I'm, I, I'm asking myself, is there something systemic about the way women are outside of the financial uh, 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 wealth and, and, and health of our nation when we are a leading nation and a leading economy? And so your work and your rally that education and confidence have equity when we speak to women and financial empowerment really hits home, what are you doing about the financial education of women? Well, starting with the, the, the wellness center and what I talk about is financial fitness. And I desperately want to change the, the taboo and I really believe that women need to be part of the economy and women need to take responsibility for it and not depend on their fathers, hello, and not depend on their husbands and not depend on their children. They've got to learn to depend on themselves. They have to have the courage now to really educate themselves. And I was just with a woman over the weekend whose husband was a huge neurosurgeon who ended up having an affair with the nurse for 10 years and <laughs> she gave up her career. And then when they just got divorced and it took three years, the judge sided with the husband and even some of her family property went to him. And she's now has to get a job. And after 28 years of marriage has to reinvent herself, which is, it should not have happened like that. It should not have happened like that. And so much of it is because women are so trusting and they give their power away. Well, to me, I want to lead by example. And during COVID, I did, we, um, we bought a house. I was very uncomfortable with it. But I said, how can I be a role model for other women unless I put myself in the disruptive state of discomfort? and feel deserving and deal with whatever I had to deal with. And I did it. And I did it because I want other women to do it. 
I want to stand here like you and encourage other women to take these risks. I want them to be part of the financial universe so they have a future. So the ways that I'm doing it are through education and training through a lot of, you know, we have um, 400 students at, at Fashion Institute of Technology we're pr providing micro grants to. We're working at the Grace Institute. We're working at so many different institutes to encourage women to be entrepreneurs and to give them the tools. And, you know, it's something that I believe in so deeply in my heart because in a way I feel like my father who could have mentored me in mm -hmm. financial, you know, and given me financial muscle, he didn't, he didn't, he, you know, but I, you know, I had to fight really hard to develop it myself. And, you know, it, it's very important for women to speak up. And it's what we learn at the Women's Leadership Board at the Kennedy School, women to speak up, to demand. And you know, there's tremendous gender bias. Mm -hmm. You know, the work that's done, you know, um, I can remind you of um, the, the symphony, the, the Hollywood symphony, when uh, you know there were only 14% women in the orchestra and they had to do blind auditions to get 30% women and then in Nigeria they were they couldn't get the numbers up and they didn't know why and they had to actually do the blind auditions behind the curtain barefoot because the gender bias started with the clicking of the shoes mhm mm mhm mm this is something that we, as women, we have to be really aware of. Even in the New York subway system, um, um, if you see something, say something is, um, or next stop is a woman's voice. But if you see something, say something, it's a man's voice. Don't mm -hmm. stand near the doors as a man, but you know, information is women. Command is man. And I'll tell you something else. Sometimes I call a restaurant for a reservation and they say no. And then I have my husband call back and he gets the reservation. Wow. And it's women's voices. It's the timber in women's voices. We have been conditioned to have prejudice. We do. We have a prejudice about women's voices and a man's voice. You know, we feel more secure. You know, it's our father's voice and the father, you know. So it's interesting because look at women who control the wealth in this country. And it's all about standing up. And we've got to stand up for each other. And that's where the disconnect is when women learn to support each other and hold you know each other in the esteem that they hold men the world will really be a better place and it'll change a lot oh, i just love you love you love you so much francine if people want to visit the francine a lafrac foundation they can go to falfoundation.org yes and if they want to buy jewelry or donate to the Same Sky Foundation Fund, they can go to samesky.com. I really encourage everybody to visit because not only is it just such a heartwarming and inspiring and confidence building experience to see what's going on, it's an invitation to be a part of something that actually works. And um, you do say that talent is everywhere, opportunity is not. You are working it to bring that opportunity to so many people. I first was intrigued to know you when we met at Women's Leadership Board because you were elegant, you were quiet and strongly spoken. And I thought, wow, this is the lady my mom always wanted me to become. And so I wanted to make sure I got to know you. And I did it quietly by observing you. 
but you pulled me out. Tell me your story. I, I, I've read the stuff. Tell me about you. That's how you've approached your whole life as I sit here and I listen to you growing up at five and telling people, come to my basement and continue your work. Or as I look at you as a young woman taking Hollywood by storm, when quite frankly, you didn't need the work, but you needed to work. And there's a big difference in that. And today, when you've got so much accomplished that you could just sit back and write the book, you're still writing the story. You're doing all of this stuff. Why, Francine, and what's next? You know, I feel very strongly about women and philanthropy. Explain to me why, why the boys' colleges and the big, you know, universities have huge endowments and women's colleges don't have those endowments. I want women to give to other women. I want women to be philanthropists. And I believe very strongly that I want to encourage women to not only give to art museums and their husband's alma mater, but to support other women, you know. And, and, and Francine, let me interrupt you one second to say something that's so pressing on my heart and I want you to validate if it's true. When people visit your foundation or same Sky Foundation fund, they are able to give at any level. They don't have to already be there in order to help others get there. Is that true? A hundred percent true. I mean, join us, you know, be part of what we're doing. And I think it, it's so important, of course, for men to support women, but for women to support women's causes. The philanthropy pie is such that only about 2% of the money goes to women's causes. It's so shocking. It's shocking. And I really mm. want to change it one dollar at a time because I want women's philanthropy. I want women to support each other and be that wind behind their sail and lift them up. And I want to see it in my lifetime. I want to see this in my lifetime. So I'm very excited to, you know, be one of those women. I mean, it's such a gift to me. And I want women to have the confidence to give to each other. I, I just, well, you give so much. You Listen, you got to give me a little bit more time right now, though, because we got to do four for four, okay? So um, I call my audience my family because we're all living together and you have the perfect backdrop. We're all living together on the same sky. Friacine, first of four, I want you to tell me four people who you would invite to dinner, and you've hosted some fabulous dinners, so I know you've got a list of names, but can we narrow down, if you were gonna have a dinner party and you could invite only four people from any time in history, living or, 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 or not, who would be at your table? Well, it's a very hard question. They would be, they'd have to be two tables. I mean, one table would have to have my parents and my grandparents because I have so much respect for their journey coming to America and what they overcame. And I want them to see what I'm doing too. Tell us a little bit of that journey real quick. Um, well, um, my grandfather came and he was a glazier. He, he fixed windows. And he would go at five in the morning to a park down on the Lower East Side and he would be picked, um, you know, cause he'd get there earlier than anyone else. Mm -hmm. But at a certain point he said, I could do this, let me pick the people. And he started to pick the people. And then there was a, a telephone uh, company. There was a building that exploded and he got the contract and then he went into the glass business. And then he needed a place to store the glass. And then he started building apartments. <laughs> and then my father went the next step. And now uh, 
you know, the company. It, it's such an amazing story. At some point, you're going to have to put that into production. It's such an amazing story, Francine. And you're fa- and look, finding people jobs is in your lineage, is in your heritage. So you've got you've got your parents and your grandparents at one table. Who's at the other table? Well, I mean, I made a film about um, actually at the other table is some of the great friends that I've lost over the years that have meant so much to me. And I think we all have that table in our heart, you know, and we honor those relationships and more than people of history, the people that have affected our history and wanting so badly to share that with them. So, um, you know, there's people that I admire in history, but if I had the chance, I'd see those people that I lost. Yeah, I've got one um, in this painting behind me, my husband. What a handsome guy. Yeah. What a handsome guy. Yeah. Uh, Francine, that's one for four. Let's go two for four, okay? Um, what are the four pieces of best advice you've been given that you would share with others. You innovate so much advice, but certainly you've been given advice that you can pass forward and why? Does it have to be four? Yeah. Can I give you more? You can give me more lady. I love you. Yes. Um, consider the source. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, the mind is a dangerous place to wander alone. Wow. Um, we all have talent that we can share. Um, one thing I felt during the pandemic, which hit me was, why was I rushing? Where was I rushing to? So stop rushing. Mm -hmm. I think... Um, trust the universe. Wow. That's a big one because a lot of people are doing anything but that right now, aren't they? Yeah. Well, I think people are going through tremendous depression Mm -hmm. and I think it's very slow moving and it's going through them. And I want so badly for this country to be open again. And I want so badly for people to have opportunity so it's just, it's a very rough time in the, un- in, in the whole universe. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, because we have listeners across the globe. And I know many of my own team members who will listen in uh, Poland are going to hear what you're saying and uh, be educated by you. I think every woman feels this way. And I would love people to not be so hard on themselves. You know, I think it's so important to embrace yourself and embrace your gratitude and to, you know, trust the universe and not beat yourself up. I mean, it's just, it's just, it, and that's why I say the mind is a dangerous place to wander alone because I want people to do and not overthink things, you know, we all have dreams and talents and wishes and allow them to come through, but stop being such a naysayer, you know, Mm -hmm. stop putting obstacles in front of your nose enough. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, 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 and I think one of the beautiful things about our relationship at women's leadership board is that women come from all places and all spaces. And when they walk in that door, it's as though I heard the story of how when We Are the World was being created, that song to uh, give give back to the world. There was a sign up that you don't just leave your cell phones at the door, you leave your attitudes, you know, and uh, everybody would, you know, come together regardless of how individually strong they were. Uh, Women's Leadership Board gives us that, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. You're certainly mm-hmm. a great role model. Mm-hmm. Um, Francine, that's two for four. Uh-huh. Although you, you gave us more than four. Okay, maybe I'll get out of the rest. What are you, re- well, well, if you got more, please share them. 
you're throwing gems here. You're dropping gems, as 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 my uh, as my young family say. You're dropping gems. No, I think I'm done. <laughs> okay, well then we're going, girl. We're going to. What do you? Uh, what are the four books that you recommend be read? And right now, that list may look different than if I'd asked you this just over a year ago. <laughs> Well, I think everyone should read Banker to the Poor, the Muhammad Yunus book. Um, I just read Dana Perino's Everything Will Be Okay. She just came out with a great book and we're going to interview her and she's amazing. Um, Melinda Gates's book, The Moment of Lift is very inspirational. And, and why I, should people read it? What, what do they get from it? I think people come to me all the time and they struggle with their own philanthropy. And I think if they read this book, it will express how she struggled with philanthropy and how she defined it to um, reflect her personality, you know, mm -hmm. and, and everyone needs to go through that process because mm -hmm. it's not an easy process, you know, mm -hmm. and you have to make things your own in life. Mm -hmm. You know, otherwise they're not going to stick. Wow. Just dropping gems. That's another one. <laughs> and, and number four. <laughs> well, I think number four, there was, there's an amazing book by Gilles Perrault on the Red Orchestra about all of these heroes during World War II. But then there's another book called Shantaram. I don't know if you read it. And it's really the story of India. And it's just an extraordinary book of how many cultures and many diverse cultures learn to live together. Mm -hmm. Wow, wow, wow. Francine, I just love you so much. I can hardly wait to hug you. Oh my God. Okay, let's go four for four. And uh, that's about what you're listening to, music wise. Oh God, well, you're gonna be- And here. why, and why? You know, one of the things I love to do is exercise. Mm -hmm. So I love pop music. So yeah, I yeah. confess, I love BTS and Dua Lipa and Bad Bunny. And I love, you know, Z100. And I mean, I love it. I can't oh, get enough good. of it. So oh. I can't say musically, you know, it's too sophisticated, my taste. But I love pop music and I have always loved pop music. Well, you know, pop music is uh, the people's music and you, everything that you've talked about, that you've invested yourself in from five till now has been about getting out and helping people uplift their circumstances. I can't think of a better genre of music for you to be listening to, because it keeps you so relevant as you seek to serve. I adore you, adore you, adore you. The time with you has been so incredible. Is there any parting thought you want to share with us or um, anything you want to ask of us? Well, I just think the universe is so lucky to have you in my life and their life because look at how much you brought to this world and what a great role model and example you are. And I'm just very fortunate and blessed to be one of your great admirers. So thank you. Oh girl, oh girl, from my heart to your home, I send love and we gotta get together and hug soon. I'm fully vaccinated, so. Me too. Okay, it'll be sooner than we thought. I love you, Francine. I love you. Francine A. Lafrat, you are a force among women. You are such a platform for the voice of women. And I think that everything you do so intentionally is helping our whole community. And I'm talking about the world community. You're making your impact across this globe. I love you for it. And I pray for you to stay strong and healthy and enjoy life and give your hubby a big hug. I will. I will. And I pray the same for you. And I hope that you have the strength and I know you do to deal with all the things you're dealing with. And it's really so beautiful to see who you are and, and have 
that bird's eye view and that front row seat. I love it and I won't give it up. Wow, wow, you're always in my life, lady. Hey guys, you have had the pleasure of visiting with Francine A. LaFrat. She is such an incredible woman. She's referred to as a social entrepreneur and she's doing that by making her biggest impact on the financial empowerment of women. We know that when women do well, the world does well. You've been privileged today to meet such a woman and also to come into my home and meet a friend. I love her dearly and now I know you do too. Thanks for being here.